everyone. I'm Day Day Wilson of FODMAP Every Day. We're thrilled to be bringing you this webinar. Uh, Robin Jaffin, my partner, will be handling the tech. Please feel free to use the chat function to write questions that we will uh, hopefully address by the end of the hour. We're thrilled to bring to you Jessica Rucroft, who's a dietitian in Canada. And this is her jam. This is her specialty. We are here to talk about IBS subtypes. We talk about IBS a lot in general, but Jessica really is the one who has gotten us very excited at FODMAP every day about <laughs> developing new and, and more specific content for all of you so you can uh, have the best care possible. So Jessica, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy. Fantastic. So why don't you just start out by telling us a little bit about your story and why you're so passionate about the IBS subtypes? Yes, absolutely. So hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And thanks for sharing your subtype in the chat. It really helps me understand who you are and what you're struggling with, with your primary bowel habit. Um, so yeah, I'm Jessica Rucroff. You can just call me Jess. Um, I'm from Vancouver, Canada. And about, I think it was six years ago, we had a traumatic incident in our family. And it just seemed that overnight, I literally just stopped digesting my food properly. Just diarrhea times infinity. And it was, I mean, that's frustrating for anyone, but as a registered dietitian, having absolutely no idea what in the blue places is going on with your gut, it it literally just, it was like the rug was pulled right underneath my feet. I had immediately so much compassion for anyone who has ever struggled with their gut. And yeah, so uh, of course I did what most of you probably did or maybe are still doing, which is, you know, pull up the spreadsheet, look at... <laughs> You track your meals, your drinks. What, what is it? Like, why? Why am I feeling this way? And somewhere along the line, you stumbled across maybe the low FODMAP diet or some resources on FODMAP every day, or you found a dietitian or your doctor diagnosed with IBS. That's great. Um, my, my realization that I had IBS um, came from the fact that I uh, was teaching the low FODMAP diet in another dietitian's practice. And I started the diet, experienced some pretty good symptom relief, went back to my doctor and lo and behold, IBS diagnosis. But even though I was sort of eating textbook healthy, eating all my plants, all the low FODMAP foods, sure, there's a lot of learning, a lot of stumbling blocks with the low FODMAP diet that I experienced, like anyone does, struggle is part of the struggle struggles part of everyone's story when they do low FODMAP. So we expect and embrace struggle here. Um, but it just, I was extra surprised at how many unexplained flare-ups I was having. I don't know if you've experienced that in the chat. Maybe you can put it there. When you feel like you had a day that was totally low FODMAP, you were eating healthy, you're doing all the things, you're exercising, and then you still had some wild flare-up, you weren't particularly stressed, you had a good sleep, let me know because that was me. Yeah, right? So... <laughs> I started to get super curious about why, if I'm on this diet and I'm following it literally to a T, I love home cooking, I love it all, why? Why am I still having these, oh, hi, you have to literally bolt from the swing set with your child into like the public bathroom and have major, major crazy diarrhea. So then, <laughs> to, to get long story short, I realized that the specific subtype I had, IBSD, doesn't just get all the way better with low FODMAP. You get really great progress. Don't get me wrong, as you diarrhea folks probably have also recognized, or maybe you haven't, maybe you have, that you do get really good relief. But if you feel like you're still kind of like off guard once in a while, like, what, what was that? Um, I really implore everyone to you know, uh, join us and hunker down and let's review the IBS subtypes and why um, some flare-ups can still happen. So once I realized and did all the hard legwork <laughs> for you <laughs> as to why I still had diarrhea despite my squeaky clean diet and all the stuff, 
um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll share that with you as well, all the, all the tips and tricks. So why don't you just define for us the, the four types, because we've been focusing on diarrhea, but why don't you take us through the four? Yeah, exactly. So for anyone who doesn't know, there are four subtypes of IBS. There's constipation predominant, which means that more than 25% of the time, your abnormal poops. So if you have an abnormal poop, more than 25% of those are constipation-like. Um, there is something called the Bristol stool chart that I can share. Actually, maybe do you want me to share it right now? I don't know if that helps. Maybe we'll continue. Maybe we'll continue. And if anyone wants to see the Bristol stool chart, I can throw that up later. And we also, for those who are wondering, we do have um, we do have it up on the site. And anything that we reference, just so you guys know, any articles or whatever, when we follow up with the recording, um, we will be giving you links to articles and things that are mentioned. It's also in the IBS subtypes article that FODMAP Everyday has on the site that I authored. So yeah, check it out. So constipation predominant IBS, more than 25% of your abnormal poops are type one or two, which means the little marbles or rabbit pellets, or which looks like little marbles or rabbit pellets shoved together in a hard lumpy log, those are actually still constipation poops. A lot of people don't understand this. What I do recommend is when you go to your doctor and talk about your digestive system, um, digestive issues, take a photo of your poop. A picture is worth a thousand words in the uh, words of my colleague, Selena, she's a celiac dietitian, and she gets clients to send her pictures of her poops and I do too. So take a picture of it, head to the doctor, what is it? And for IBSC, you have 25% of your abnormal poops, less than 25% of your abnormal poops are diarrhea or looser. So you're dealing with mainly hard constipation poops, rabbit pellets, or what looks like a log with a bunch of rabbit pellets or pebbles shoved together. Those are constipation. The second subtype is my personal favorite, just because it's me, it's the IBSD, which is more than 25% of the time you have the lower, more mushier, softer bowel movements uh, at the bottom of the Bristol stool chart. They can be round blobs with fluffy edges, or they can like you flush the toilet and they just kind of disintegrate into a fine mist, or they um, have a uh, liquid stool consistency. So no solid pieces. So that is more than 25% of the time. And then less than 25% of the time, do you ever feel those constipation poops? When you are mixed, you get this lovely roller coaster of more than 25% of the time you experience those hard rabbit pellet poops or those those hard lumpy logs and more than 25% of the time you get the diarrhea. So, and then there's IBSU, which is you experience abdominal pain um, related to pooping, just like the other subtypes. I forgot to say that first. You experience abdominal pain with defecation and there's a change of stool, either form or frequency. So you're either pooing more and the stool has changed. Your poop is changing shapes and so forth. IBSU, you don't fit any uh, under any of those specific categories for IBS, D, C, and M. So those are the subtypes. Any questions about those, throw them in the chat. We'd be happy to answer them. I have a question. Yes. <laughs> okay. So what's the difference between uh, someone who maybe changes from one subtype to another and someone who is defined as mixed? Because if it's mixed, you are changing, right? So does it have to do with like a time frame? Like maybe for years and years and years you were constipated and then all of a sudden you change and you have diarrhea? Uh, absolutely. And it's really important to note if anything ever changes and it's experienced, oh, sorry, you is unclass, unclassified or uncategorized. Sorry. Um, so if you feel like anything is a sudden change, that could be a red flag to head to your doctor. Side note. Um, most people actually do change subtypes. I forget which scientific study I was reading, but it's usually within a year, someone can change a subtype. Typically we see the diarrhea subtypes, anything with diarrhea, either IBSD or IBSM, change into constipation. Quite rarely do we see constipation go back to diarrhea. So you can change, yeah, in a week, you can change from constipation, diarrhea, constipation, diarrhea, that would be more mixed. If over time, gradually, you are now moving into another subtype sort of description, like the 25% rule thing, that's when I would say you look like you're morphing subtype, you're changing subtype, and that happens. So you talked about taking photos, which I love. I've actually never heard anybody say that, and it makes so much sense, because we, we <laughs> do know that 
a lot of times patients will try to describe a symptom and their words aren't necessarily the words that doctors or dietitians would use to describe the same thing. And then you get the miscommunication, right? But if you got a picture, so that's a great, that's a great tip. So let's talk about that. So diagnosis, people are struggling even to get an IBS diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So how, um, I mean, a lot of people in this group apparently are already diagnosed with a subtype, but um, maybe some aren't. So how does that happen? Is that dietitian? Is that your GI? Uh, talk a little bit about that. Yes. In an ideal perfect world, you go into your doctor, you describe what's happening. They send you for a couple tests, especially one celiac screen and two check for inflammation to see if you have any sort of inflammatory bowel issues. Hopefully those all come back negative and when they do, if you also fit that IBS Rome criteria of abdominal pain at least one day a week, and it's um, been happening for more than three months, and it's associated with, that pain is associated with whenever you need to go to the bathroom, either it makes it better, makes it worse, usually makes it better, and your poop changes in what it looks like and how often you go. So sometimes you go more, like that's me. Sometimes you go way less, that constipation, and then back and forth, of course, we talked about mixed. So that after you are screened for celiac disease, that comes back negative. And hopefully you did not cut out gluten before you saw the doctor. That's the number one thing I see. Don't cut out gluten until you have your celiac screen. At least eat a couple slices of, say, sourdough bread every day, two weeks, then go in for that blood test. That'll give you a better shot at getting an accurate result. Um, and then, so once that's negative and inflammatory markers don't, are elevated in your blood, one is called a CRP. The other one, they're going to screen your poop and it's called a fecal calprotectin. If those come back negative and you meet the wrong criteria for IBS, then that would be an IBS diagnosis as long as you don't have any other alarm features or red flags like blood in the stool, fever, or these symptoms started after the age of 50, et cetera. All the alarm features are listed in that IBS subtypes article. Well, not all of them, most of them. Um, so check with that. That should land you at a diagnosis of IBS with your doctor. Usually though, it comes with about 10 years of searching <laughs> for a diagnosis. On average, people with IBS take about 10 years to get diagnosed. And several, and going through several medical professionals. Like yes. This is, this is a typical story. Yeah, and dropping a lot of money on some bogus tests. I usually see a few of those sprinkled in between because... Yes. Yeah. Um, that, but, that's yeah. just... This is a, that's a side, uh, that's a tangent because we do have some questions we want to get to, but let's just address that really briefly. So for all of you who are listening, right, so far we're talking about accurate diagnosis and we're talking about doing that with a medical professional. Mm -hmm. um, if you're on Facebook and you have anything to do with um, digestive health, you're probably bombarded with uh, ads for gadgets and that you can breathe into and for home tests that you can pee on, poop on, breathe on, like whatever. Um, you have to have an accurate diagnosis. And right now, none of these home tests are going to give it to you. So can you just- yes. Absolutely. I'm glad that you mentioned that. And then once, if you are, you have this discussion with your doctor, ideally, <laughs> And if they say, it looks like you have a little bit of IBS, I, I really do implore you to not leave the room until you say, what does that mean a little bit? Does that mean I have IBS or not? Because that sort of waffly diagnosis isn't really that validating or helpful for people with IBS. And even further, if you can describe to your doctor, take about two weeks worth of poop data, any abnormal poops, write them down. And if you know that you meet that sort of 25% cutoff for abnormal poops being too hard or too soft or a mixture, tell your doctor that, or like I said, take a picture because that could allow them the data, the information they need to subtype you. And that can help you find so many more resources. I mean, it's interesting though. I did look up <laughs> some subtype specific resources and I, I came up pretty short. So this is why I'm on this mission to do this. 
they realize there's a big gap here in exactly subtype specific. So this is a really good segue because one of the questions you wanted to address was what are some things that you would apply with patients uh, regardless of subtype? that would be helpful. And then let's get into a little bit about what are the specific things that you recommend depending on subtype. For sure. Okay, we're gonna bl blaze through these because if you are here and you know your subtype, usually you've probably already done these things and you're like, yes, this helps and maybe this doesn't or et cetera. But temporarily reducing high FODMAP foods guided by a registered dietitian, ideally. Gut-directed hypnotherapy like Nerva, the Nerva app, I love it cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, mindfulness strategies, some herbal supplements, there's Ibaragast, enteric coated peppermint oil, um, eating slower and chewing thoroughly, that's huge, especially if you have diarrhea, gentle movement, um, especially if you have constipation, moving helps get things moving, eating um, modifications that are healthier, like um, making more of your own food, eating some more plants, etc., and diaphragmatic breathing, and of course, sleep. Those are your generals. Okay. And so let's talk about specifics. Yes. Okay. So the reason why I am so passionate about the specifics are because some of these super healthy tips that are generally recognized as that's good for everybody or that's not good for everybody actually could be a tool for you or a trigger. So, for example, a seemingly healthy general wellness habit or tip that might cause problems for my subtype of IBS would be eat more roughage, eat more fiber, load your plate with all the lettuces, cabbages, all the stuff that can actually slam. I like the, um, the IBS, a car analogy. So everyone with IBS, the different subtypes are driving a car. I drive an IBS D car. So anything that goes into my gas tank, my body's default reaction is go away faster speed up the gut. Whereas constipation predominant folks, you have a car that anything that goes into your gas tank, you slam on the brakes, not helpful. And then anything that an IBSM goes in their gas tank, that's a trigger that makes you bunny hop fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. So for me eating the, all the plants and all the roughage just slams on the gas pedal. My gut already goes too fast. Thank you very much. A massive salad, the size of my head or a smoothie, the size of my head or a huge plate of fruit salad is likely going to cause my gut to speed up a lot. Whereas on the flip side, if you have constipation that's kind of rooted in lack of fiber, that could be one of your biggest tools. <laughs> and um, that's a great wellness tip. So you can see how it depends. So you have like general gut health information, general IBS information, subtype specific IBS information, and the way you're down at the bottom, what is the right formula for you? And that's what I most that jazzes me up a lot. Another one is drink less coffee. Coffee is a gut irritant. It'll trigger IBS. Well, for people with IBSC, coffee is, can be your bestie. Even if you have issues with caffeine, you can go decaf. That'll still help stimulate the gut because of cholinergic acid in even decaf coffee. But for myself with diarrhea, I really need to watch my caffeine and coffee across the board and do some other things that can help slow down my gut if I choose to eat or partake in anything that makes my gut go faster. One last one, it's huge, I see it all the time, is being told to take a um, really popular brand of magnesium for sleep. Magnesium is excellent for sleep. Magnesium is excellent um, for many things. We need it in our diet every day. It's about 350 milligrams for your usual intake, um, the recommended intake. However, if you take it all at once, if you're diarrhea predominant, that is going to slam on that gas pedal, my friend. If you're constipated and you have trouble sleeping, magnesium supplements could be your knight in shining armor. So you can see it is very, very dependent on your subtype. I love the coffee example because coffee is such a uh, daily ritual for so many people. And, and you gave such a great uh, description of how for someone who has IBSC, it could be a boon. For somebody for with IBSD, not your friend. So that's a perfect example of how uh, your 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 the way you approach your specific IBS uh, can be tailored. Mm -hmm. So um, okay, so we really talked about a little bit. I mean, you gave some top tips. 
let's talk about your new mini guides because you're really drilling down into this so yeah. people can gain access to information specific to what they have. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I see there's lots of questions in the chat and can't wait to get to them. So I'm trying not to be distracted. I'm getting, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get you, don't worry. Um, so before I chat about the mini guides, yes, there are a, uh, there's a link to my website. And for the time being, these resources are free. The mini guides, I have them specific for each subtype. Um, and they really are a broad overview of the general things that work with people with IBS-C, ibs D, IBS M, et cetera, and in general, what things usually do not work with these subtypes. So go check it out, download it. When you download it, in my system, you're tagged with IBS D, C, or M, so that you're not going to get an email ever that's not going to be relevant to you. I don't spam. I don't like to, I, I just want to talk to you and exactly what you're going through as best as I can to help you. Anyway, side note. Um, but in each of these guides, you will have specific tips for each subtype of IBS. For example, in my IBS-D mini guide, it talks about fiber balance and other things that speed up the gut versus help you slow down your gut. So when I say fiber balance, I mean soluble fiber therapy is very helpful for people with IBS-D. Right now in that mug that I'm drinking, I have a packet of Acacia Senegal, which is a low FODMAP soluble fiber source that does not cause bloating, that feeds my good gut bugs, even though I have to take down certain FODMAPs in my diet. So it's bifidogenic and it helps to tap the brakes and form my stools so that I can have a cup of coffee comfortably and help kind of ease my system because I love coffee. I'm not going to stop drinking it. <laughs> so fiber balance, soluble fiber therapy, number one tip for IBSD. Um, at the end of this uh, session, I'll talk to you about the ultimate guide, which I also have um, and that goes into exactly how and what doses, et cetera, and all these other tips. Um, so other things that speed up the gut, the roughage. If you imagine your plate, IBS deers, if you can keep that roughage, that lettuce -y, well, the vegetables that are non-starchy to a, about a third of your plate, you know, the usual recommendation is half your plate. If I ate half my plate of vegetables every meal, I would be running for the toilet all day. So if you can kind of inch that down and then once you experience your symptoms stabilizing, then you can play around with going back to loading on a little more vegetables slowly and surely. You'd be amazed at what your body can do when it gives a chance to slow its roll. So that's- you know, Oh, I was just gonna say, it's interesting. I think what Nicole <clears throat> means, and Nicole, let me know if this is true. She says the unhealthier the eat, she eats, the better she feels. I'm betting- that that's what she's addressing, that she's saying when she eats lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, which we always think is healthy, um, and they are to a degree, but also greatly depends on the type of IBS subtype you have. Is that is that what you meant, Nicole? Is it like you eat lots of fresh fruits? And she's like, absolutely, yes. All so cats, yes. Right, exactly. So I think, again, great examples, Jessica. So, you know, we've learned now, coffee, an everyday item can be good, can be bad. Fresh fruits and vegetables. How many times do you hear or read, eat more fruits and vegetables? This is healthy. This is this is what you must be adding to your diet. And maybe it's not right for you. That's why knowing your subtype is so important. And it's also, you know, this is why we constantly say work with a registered dietitian because it's their job to help understand specifically what's gonna work for you, not this person, that person, or that person, right? When you're reading general articles on the internet yourself and you're trying to um, distill what is appropriate for you, you're not a medical professional. You're not necessarily gonna know. You're gonna to find tons of articles that are telling you to eat more fruits and vegetables. You know, so, that's why the specificity is important. That's why working with a dietitian who can talk to you about your specific symptoms is really important. And if any of you were in my Facebook groups, you know that that's also why I go a little crazy when people are asking, well, what are you doing 
What are you doing for constipation? How do you do with a cup of blueberries a day? It doesn't matter. It's like, it's not, it, it's what works for you. And it is really individual, right? Because yeah. also, can we talk a little bit about non-food triggers just briefly? Because just as a general dietitian thing, because mm -hmm. I think that, you know, people are in our groups because we're talking about the low FODMAP diet. The low FODMAP diet is very much about food, but IBS involves everything. I mean, you mentioned Nerva, for instance. So, I mean, can you talk a little bit about non-food triggers? Absolutely. I mean, number one I would find would just be not so much food, but just sneaky additives in, in, in some supplements that I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd consider food or not. So like say, um, you know, uh, like a artificial saliva with xylitol that got one of my IBS sears in some bloating, um, trouble. Um, in general, I would say the biggest thing would be everything we do, every recommendation we see that is not addressing the dysfunction of your gut and your brain connection is a merely, I would not, I wouldn't call it so loosely as a band-aid because I want to validate it more than that, but it's more of a way to stabilize your symptoms until you can get help with sorting out that gut brain connection thing, because at the end of the day, that is the master control of something went wrong. So our gut and our brain are, I like to say, they're literally just yelling at each other. We need to get them to talk nicely again. And the Nerva app does that. So it'll help you if you're IBS C or D or M or U. <laughs> so it's across the board, just an excellent resource. Um, and then and for the other those, I'll just interject for those wondering gut directed hypnotherapy is clinically proven. It's not yeah. this woo woo thing. Like it's a, it's a clinically proven approach to IBS. And in fact, there are studies that show that gut directed hypnotherapy is equal to, can be equal to the low FODMAP diet in helping you to alleviate symptoms. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I like to say that I keep that to step two of my program because, it, for example, for myself with IBSD, if I'm running to the toilet, I don't have time to lie there for 15 minutes and be in a session. So what I like to do is all the stuff to stabilize symptoms. And then once we feel like we are in a safe spot to lie down there for 15 minutes, um, just to help dull the, <laughs> the fire of IBS symptoms that we get. Um, then we have a chance to just, okay, now we can dedicate some time and some energy um, to, to healing that gut brain connection. Cause there's something called spoon theory. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of it. It's when you're struggling with your IBS, whether it's DC, M or U, you literally just have less spoons to spend throughout your day. Say you wake up on a good day, you have 20 spoons. You can spend maybe five of those spoons on dedicating, clearing out your schedule to do a, a session or to go for a walk or something like that. But when you have a horrible flare up day, you may wake up feeling like you only have five spoons and you just have to pick what you need to do to kind of survive the day. I don't know if this resonates with anyone, but definitely resonates with me when I have a flare up. You'll be off the couch. I don't want to do anything. Um, so yeah, that's why I usually, I like to do all the tools and, and tri tricks and strategies to just, okay, now can we just step out of the bathroom and then dedicate some time to doing the Nerva and all the non- food related things that help with IBS movement. And that, that also brings up something that I think a lot of people don't realize and they get frustrated with, which is that you're, what we have, all have to remember is our GI tract is not static and your life is not static, right? Like yes. Monday, you had a fight with your boss. Mm -hmm. Tuesday, you know, something amazingly positive happened to you. I mean, both of those could actually be a type of stress right? Even though one is positive and one is negative. And then some days you sleep well, some days you don't. So, you know, the, the ups and downs and the variability to the way your gut is, is presenting itself is normal, right? I mean. Absolutely. Yeah. And it kind of, the gut directed hypnotherapy, I saw there's a question about it. It just puts your body in a state of deep relaxation. And when that happens, when you flip the switch to that survival mode, there's a saber tooth tiger chasing me and back to, oh, I am safe. Everything's fine. 
that is when you kind of build up resiliency against stressors slowly but surely over time. So it kind of like helps your gut and your brain sort of just, again, talk to each other nicely. And when you do have stressors, you'll find that slowly but surely over time, they're going to be less and less impactful on specifically your gut and your symptoms and flare-ups. Does that make sense? I like the example, like sometimes we use the example of, um, so people understand the gut-brain connection. So you're really happy and excited about something and you feel butterflies in your stomach. Well, think about that for a minute, right? The excitement's up here. And then you get this physical sensation in your gut or like on the other hand, I mean, to take another extreme, you're facing something really stressful and intense. Like you're about to give a speech to, you know, a hundred thousand people or, you know, public speak, like whatever. And you literally throw up because you're so nervous. (laughs) The same thing. This is, this is, this is the stress and the body reaction. So, uh, oh, they want to know if you do it with a practitioner. The link right above Arlene for the Nerva article. Check out that article. Nerva is an app for people who are wondering um, that uh, actually one of the people on the board who developed it is from Monash University. So this is a uh, a really well-researched system. And basically you have 15 minutes a day where you do, it's like a guided meditation and you're listening to the app someone's speaking you through a scenario and it's incredibly relaxing. And uh, like I said, it's clinically proven to work and can be very helpful. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, thanks for that <laughs> that segue. Um, should we go to the top tips for constipation? Yes. Why don't you do that? So the top tips that I mentioned in my IBSC mini guide include magnesium. And I know there was a question in the group, which magnesium do I recommend? I recommend magnesium citrate because it can be um, a lot more gentle and a lot less bloating. So uh, magnesium oxide out there can be a little bit more bloating. So that's the one that I usually try to steer people away from. Um, and magnesium, uh, magnesium citrate um, is just a magnesium salt that just pulls water gently into your bowel. Ideally, as you sleep, if you take it in one dose, about 400 milligrams, that'll get things um, usually moving for a nice morning bowel movement. So that is one of the biggest game changers for my IBSC folks. Now, magnesium is not for everybody. If you have kidney problems and other, all the other things, of course, we check with our doctor before we touch any medication, supplements, or diet and lifestyle changes. However, magnesium, if you are an ordinary healthy person with no um, contraindications to taking magnesium, game-changing for the constipated um, IBS-Cers. I mean, yeah, IBS-Cers. And also, I cannot stress this enough, if you can get your doctor to order some imaging, if you feel like you're just fully, fully constipated, you feel like even eating a salad just really doesn't sit well with you, I do always um, implore my constipation predominant, lovely IBS folks to ask their doctor if some imaging might be appropriate for them. So an x-ray, are you absolutely so full of stool that um, we need to kind of pivot and see what what else we can do to just get things moving, Uh, for example. So if we throw a salad on you and you have a really sluggish, slow colon um, and you're just full of stool, that's it's like, I love how um, Tamara Froman says it's like loading more cards in an already backed up traffic jam in her book. I love that. It's true. So you're just going to make it worse, right? I just loaded, I just linked her article. Are you full of <laughs> stool? Yeah. But we don't use the stool word. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So if we're, if we're full, yeah. So, so there's that consideration. And I mentioned that in my IBSC mini guide that the, the one day meal plan example in my IBSC mini guide is um, very high in roughage. And if it does not agree with you, um, it might be time to check out if you have a pelvic floor issue or get some imaging. Is there a blockage? Is there a narrowing? I have a, one client who has a very narrow colon and she has to chew very, very well. She takes spinach better in a smoothie as opposed to a salad, etc. So these are the, some of the things that are, are you know, this IBS seers can even further be subtype classified even further of do you work well with higher roughage or is this really really not what you need so we have gut health information ibs information subtype specific ibs ibs information and then yeah right down here that was that just for you information but my mini guides hit that ibs subtype specific information 
um, that could help if you want to explore that further as well. And of course, work with a dietitian, please. <laughs> okay, so IBSM and IBSUs. Okay, so these are the trickier ones. And I'm sorry, you have not as much research done uh, uh, compared to the Ds and the Cs. However, IBSMs, my lovely IBSM folks, a lot of them really do respond to magnesium at night, the magnesium citrate. Um, and the reason why is because there's an there's an sort of a, a suspicion that IBSMs, the baseline issue is constipation. And then when that gets backed up so much, and then the floodgates open and then you have diarrhea for a whole bunch of days, everything getting more and more loose as it goes. The, the baseline there, I'm, I'm not really saying this well, but you could just be having an underlying level of constipation. So if you can get a regular daily bowel movement and that alleviates that, oh, I'm backed up for three days and now I literally spent all day or two in the toilet because it's all coming out now, um, that is also very uh, helpful to explore. Also, going back to that soluble fiber therapy idea for IBSD, soluble fiber works um, very well for anyone with any sort of type of diarrhea involvement. So um, if you don't want to try magnesium at night, or if you can't, um, perhaps explore whether or not soluble fiber therapy, especially taking about two grams of soluble fiber at night um, as you sleep, it should help stools that are too hard soften or get moist, and it helps stools that are too loose form together. Um, and again, my favorite um, fiber for that is Acacia Senegal or partially hydrolyzed guar gum. Um, the brand names for those are Fiber 4 and there's a Heather's Tummy Fiber. A lot of different brands have them, but just make sure it's low FODMAP. I don't go for psyllium first because it can be moderately gassy for a lot of my people and very bloaty. And the other thing I recommend for IBSMs would be to just really get clear on your top three symptoms. If it's bloating, well, we've got different sort of over-the-counter medications. You could take 30 minutes before each meal, like semethicone. I don't even know if I remember pronouncing it right, but close, close enough, you get it. And there's certain ones um, that are low FODMAP as well, because some chewable tablets, as you find, can have high FODMAP additives to them. And so really getting clear on your constellation of symptoms and kind of doing what it, you need to feel better. So if it's bloating, again, you could try out Fodzyme. Um, and, and so forth. If it's, if it's reflux, then I would say stay away from things like peppermint, peppermint coffee, chocolate. If you have abdominal pain, try taking enteric coated peppermint oil before 30 minutes before um, every meal. So really the same with the IBSUs, really getting clear on what your top three biggest struggles are, bringing those to your dietitian ideally, um, and being sort of the experimenter. I like to try one thing at a time, for say three to, days to a week, and then see how much better that makes you feel. If you do all the things at once, sometimes that kind of muddies the water. We're not really sure what it is. That's been the game changer. So yeah, that's your subtype specific biggest tips. And all the rest of the tips are again found in my IBS mini guides on my- now, Suzanne said, this is interesting. She says her difficulty is frequency of bowel movements. Now, I, I don't know if this is Suzanne's point, but- I think a lot of us think of diarrhea as, you know, incredibly loose, watery stools. But what if you're going frequently, but even though you're going frequently, the stools have shape? Mm -hmm. what, what is that? <laughs> What's up with that? What and is that? I feel you there. Oh, I'll send you a picture. <laughs> and actually, please do, because I am, my question right back to you is, are they formed soft snake-like logs? Or are they really skinny, like pencil type shapes? Because again, what your poop looks like could definitely help your practitioner figure out some things to try. So sometimes if someone's poop is very sticky, hard to wipe, and it comes out in those little pencil strings, maybe it's time to grab a SIBO breath test. Or maybe if it's sort of rusty and hard to wipe, tarry and sticky, Maybe you've got some sneaky FODMAPs in your diet that we still haven't figured out. But if its frequency is, is, is problematic for you, again, soluble fiber therapy really helps to, if it's at least frequent, it's not going to be so schmooey. <laughs> and when you go, it's going to kind of come out in more of like a complete 
poop, you heard the word incomplete evacuation, soluble fiber helps with incomplete evacuation. It helps you feel like you're getting it all out and, you know, less poops, in other words. Can I just say, I love the fact that we're talking about schmooing and uh, marbles and string-like poops. I mean, because this is what needs to be able to be discussed, right, in an open forum without being embarrassed and without being horrified. And, yeah. you know, as they say, I mean, even little kids know, you know, everybody poops. Um, but we need to talk about um, if it's a problem, right? If lack thereof or texture or whatever. Yeah. So, oh, people are like, <laughs> yay, yes. Word. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, oh, she says she goes every few days, but then she has leakage and then sometimes she has normal poops. Uh, you know, this is, we can't obviously drill into um, individual medical advice during the webinar. I think that what we're really trying to get across to all of you is that IBS is not one thing. Um, there are four broad subtypes. You, might be slotted in to one of those subtypes, but even if you are IBSD and this person's IBSD, your treatment might not necessarily look the same because everything about IBS is individual, mm -hmm. so individual. And that's why you do need the right medical support preferably with a dietitian. I mean, if you're in this world of FODMAPs and you already know that um, FODMAPs are an issue for you and there's some level of sensitivity, then you want to find a dietitian who's FODMAP savvy as well as just a really good general dietitian. We do have um, resources for you guys um, for that. And then of course, the, the uh, guides that Jess has uh, prepared for you have all of the stuff detailed uh, within. Yeah, so please do check them out. Suzanne says she's working with a Monash trained dietitian. That's fantastic. Oh, that's well, before we, so what else? I mean, what are what are the high level messages that you want to get across? Mm -hmm. um, that if you feel like there's too many unexplained flare ups, and you feel like you're kind of like the FODMAP king or queen, and you're like I. <laughs> look at my food. I don't understand. There's this all low FODMAP and I'm still experiencing XYZ. Um, it could be your subtype. It could be something else layered on. I'm, I think I saw a question about SIBO. 40% of people with IBS may have a layer of SIBO. Um, however, if we go through the basic fundamental steps of what usually works for most, like I do have that outlined in my IBSD ultimate guide, I lay out the soluble fiber therapy plan. I lay out how to put together a plate that's low to moderate and roughage, 50 snacks for IBSD, et cetera. If we do all those things and it still doesn't feel, and you work with your dietitian or and it still feels like you have unexplained flare-ups, then absolutely it's time to head back to the doctor and question for sure. Um, but I would really take a close look at your subtype first and review in those guides um, the general free guides, if you'd like, um, or the IBSD guide is what I have now to just sort of try and put the pieces a little bit um, more together, because this is what I found to be most helpful is coming up with the, the exact sort of steps. I mean, IBSD, to be honest, it's a little bit easier to treat and the steps are much more clear. Um, because as we discussed the IBS sears, there could be different reasons for the constipation and different things may work and really not work, like the difference in, in roughage. But unless we try to do the steps, we can't, if we give it the college try first and then it doesn't work, oh yes, then of course, let's question and do all the things and see what else, you know, what else can we dig up, like a layer of SIBO, a layer of bile acid malabsorption, uh, maybe it's time to go back. If your last screen for celiac disease was more than a few years ago, things change, right? And we, you know, I think that another thing that we always like to remind people is that you mentioned it before about just making one change at a time and really monitoring. So I yeah. think that because 
we all eat every day, right? We need to eat. And so all of us as humans, our relationship with food is casual in the sense that we don't think of it as a, a medical thing. We don't think of it as something that could affect us like that. And so I think the idea, people just think, oh, why do I need a dietitian? I know how to eat. But mm -hmm. as just said, if you're constantly having issues where you're going this way, you're going that way, you, you look at your diet, you can't understand. I mean, the other thing is not, you know, throwing a bunch of things at the wall at the same time, right? So if you have a dietitian, listen to what they're having you do, take it slowly, do one thing at a time. If you all of a sudden read an article and it tells you, you know, Metamucil is going to solve all your problem problems, don't layer that on to whatever else it is that you're doing, because uh, just like the, the low FODMAP diet, you need to have a structure, to your to your approach because otherwise you're not going to come out with the data that you need that that applies to you sure. um debbie wants to know how to find a good dietitian who specializes in ibs and reflux in canada hmm jess do you know anybody <laughs> hello well i'm registered in bc it depends where do you live um and again if you go on the monash app um there is dietitians listed for your province your state your country um, et cetera, but I'm in BC. And we'll put, we'll put our list as well. We have a global uh, directory uh, that we will uh, put up for people. And also know that a lot of people, a lot of dietitians are um, doing remote sessions these days. So you don't necessarily have to stick close to home. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so let's, we have about 10 minutes left. So we're gonna just open it up for questions unless there's anything else you want to really get to right now, Jessica. Uh, I just want to implore that you, if you are if either, whatever subtype, that you go download a mini guide from my website, take a look, try one thing, obviously check with your doctor first. If it's IBSD, soluble fiber therapy. If it's IBSC, magnesium, magnesium at night. Um, if it's IBSM, either soluble fiber therapy or magnesium at night. If it's IBSU, just check in which are your symptoms the worst and then um, check out the guide that I have there and see if you can match um, a supplement or a strategy to it. And if you are diarrhea predominant IBS like me, again, I can't recommend enough to go and grab my ultimate guide, my IBSD ultimate guide. It's literally a summary of what I teach in my program here in BC. My program here in BC is a thousand dollars and the roadmap to that is in that ultimate guide. So it's a steal. And because obviously I'm registered in BC, I can't do individual one-to-one -one medical nutrition therapy with everyone who I wish I could for IBSD. I wish you could talk to all of you, um, but I can't. So I put everything all those jewels in there and it's uh yeah it's an insanely good way to start if you have IBSD struggles but what I'd like to end off with is just yeah thanks for having me and I'm excited to answer some questions now and um I wanted to I wanted to touch on uh Nicole asked way in the beginning um she and I are are IBS twins her thing is bloating yes and that was my thing mm -hmm. and I I've often, I mean, some of you have heard, uh, all of you heard Jessica mention uh, the Rome criteria, and maybe you don't know what that is. So just briefly, the Rome Foundation creates this, um, creates the criteria uh, through which dietitians and doctors diagnose IBS. They use the Rome criteria and uh, they change it every now and then, like every five, six, 10 years they review and they did update, they always update it and change it slightly. But in the two times that they've updated the Rome criteria since I've been diagnosed, I've often had trouble with the Rome foundation criteria because like Nicole, um, bloating is my thing not really any bowel habit issues. And if you were to strictly listen to the Rome criteria, they say you've got to have some bowel issues. So what do you say for people who uh, were bloating is by far their worst IBS symptom? Absolutely. 
If bloating is one of your worst IBS symptoms, I also have a guide about that. <laughs> My website, it's the bloating IBS and low FODMAP starter guide. That goes through, and at the beginning of every mini guide, you have a little bit of a review of the reasons why there's bloating as well. Um, but first and foremost, I mean, we do the least restrictive stuff as possible. Are you drinking lots of pop? Are you drinking out of a straw? Are you chewing really fast? Do you talk and eat? Do you always have lunch during meetings and you're talking and eating at the same time and swallowing a bunch of air? Do you consume a lot of beer? <laughs> the, the gas has to go somewhere. If it is two to eight hours approximately after you're eating that you're experiencing this bloating, then I would say this sounds like a FODMAP issue. If it's less than 90 minutes after you're eating, um, we could have some sort of upper GI stuff going on or possibly some small intestinal bacteria overgrowth going on. Talk to your dietitian, describe where you're feeling the bloating. Is it accompanied by anything else? Is it upper tummy, lower tummy? Is it like up here and centered? If you're always bloated right here after a meal, that's maybe classic indigestion. But for bloating across the board, FODzyme, that digests some of the most common triggers for IBS folks the fructans, the galactolegos, and the lactose. So um, that is a great blend to see if you tolerate your pastas, pizzas, all that stuff uh, better if you try out a little bit of Fodzyme. Um, perhaps it's just you don't, your body doesn't work well with cabbage. My sister-in-law, she can eat certain types of lettuces and whatnot, but she can't, cabbage just for some reason does not work with her body. She doesn't have IBS, but it's just, you know what I mean? It's like Again, going back to that individual thing, um, but bloating, definitely Fodzyme, definitely chew, chew well, watch your straw and your carbonated beverage intake. And there is that semethicone. Again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly because I always type it and like- I think it's semethicone. I think it is. I, was, I never really say it in like, you know, in front of a human, um, but there's certain brands, like I said, that um, don't contain mannitol, which is another FODMAP as a sweetener. I think that one's called- oval I think that one is oval well is one it... thing we just want to mention about the enzymes so we have an article on enzymes we have an article on supplements which I've already linked so you, she Jessica was mentioning Fodzyme which is this amazing enzyme blend that a lot of people in our community have had great results with oh look at that she has it right there but but, but you're but. not supposed to just <laughs> be popping it right you're you you're the proper way to take it is post elimination post challenge phase once you know your triggers because if you start taking supplements during elimination and challenge phase they're going to alter your digestion you're not going to get a clear understanding of your relationship with fodmaps and that's what you're trying to do uh during that period of time and we know it does take time so you don't want to waste that time <laughs> so we just want to make sure you you understand the proper use of uh fodzyme yes. um Someone said, what are the connections with IBS and intestinal obstructions? I saw that question and I wasn't quite sure what you mean. Do you mean like in terms of constipation predominant IBS? Because that sounds like the most relevant example. Because or MLA, or do you mean that there's like a physical injury, like adhesions or something where there's. Yeah. So some people have narrowing of their intestines. Sometimes it's just part of their anatomy. Sometimes they have you know, scar tissue because of a surgery, you know, maybe they had a, some of their part of their part of their intestine taken out and now there's, it's extra narrow. So that would be a separate issue from IBS. However, you can have IBS and other issues at the same time that you really should work with the dietitian to kind of sort out what works best for you. In, in general, when people have narrowing or um, risk of obstruction, the biggest tip is obviously work with a doctor dietitian, make sure that we're reducing your risk of obstruction, which can include um, watching that roughage, um, making sure you're chewing really well, trying to maybe um, instead of having those big hearty fibrous roughage salads, maybe you might tolerate smoothies better um, and so on and so forth. I hope that helps, but yeah, maybe some clarification on the question. And the, um, so... Elvish says uh, that they're always bloated. People ask them if they're pregnant. First of all, 
rude people. I did that once. I will never do that again. Ask someone if they're pregnant. Um, and they're saying that they haven't had any tests yet for their di their distended belly because they would cost too much. Uh -huh. So let's talk about that for a minute. I'm not really sure what test you're talking about because there really isn't a test for bloated people. I mean, we we if you were here in the beginning, uh, we were talking about accurate diagnosis. And so the tests that are really important are you have to be tested for celiac, you maybe want to be, your doctor wants to look at diverticulitis. I mean, these things have to be screened. Uh, and IBD, you mentioned inflammatory bowel disease before an IBS diagnosis is given. Now, if an I, if you're clear on all those other things, as Jessica said before, and you're, you're, you, the doctor says, we think you have IBS, we think you should try the low FODMAP diet. For a lot of people, me included, my pregnant belly went away once I started the low FODMAP diet. But what that told us was that I am very FODMAP sensitive. So we found my trigger. So if you have been cleared for all these other things, you're doing the low FODMAP diet and you're still bloated. So there's something that has yet to be discovered, right? So what would you say, Jess? Mm -hmm. In the beginning of my bloating, low FODMAP and IBS starter guide, there's a list of reasons why we could be bloating, bloated. One of them is ovarian cancer, right? Oh, right. And endometriosis, right? This is what endometriosis. she just said. I also had that too. It was lovely. Right. Um, but there's a list. Some of the things are quite benign and some of the things are serious. So this is again, why we just don't self-diagnose. Just ask your doctor, could I have any of these things? What tests do you recommend? Um, and really advocating for yourself because sometimes, um, yeah, you're left in limbo and, you know, it's important not to be, <laughs> it's important to get clear on, are you, is there an organic meaning there's a, like something physically up and causing that bloating, or is it something that is a little bit more, um, like it's to do with the gut microbiota or how you digest FODMAPs, for example, like we were talking about, or is it just the way that you're eating? Again, all the fast eating, all the <laughs> air swallowing. Um, there's so many things to go through. And again, some of them are benign and some of them are really serious. So again, work with work with someone. It's gonna be the if it's gonna be the best investment, probably, to just ensure that you're getting all the reasons ruled out. Because um, this is your your health. You only have one body, right? So, um, exactly. Well, we're we're going to close in just a minute or two. Let's just take this last question. So can you talk a little bit about how often you should go through FODMAP challenges? How often does one's subtype sensitivity change over time? Well, those are two different questions, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you want to field them? Yeah, sure. So um, like we were saying before, you can change subtype. So usually we see people who are more diarrhea predominant or mixed can move into constipation IBS. Um, so that can happen at any time, really. Um, in terms of how often to rechallenge, there are some guidelines that say every three to six months. There are some guidelines that say every six months to a year. It really does um, depend on um, sort of what your, I like to say, how, how restricted are you? If you're super duper restricted, it'd be really nice to slowly but surely pluck away at rechallenging and seeing if you can ease any of those restrictions. If you're fairly unrestricted and it's only garlic, I just had a, I had a client to my first IBS program who it just turned out to be garlic. It was just garlic. And so she can retest garlic whenever. <laughs> it's, not, it's not like she's cutting out everything else. So yeah, it depends on, depends on you again. It depends. Sorry. It depends. <laughs> well, that's actually a really uh, good uh, place to end. I mean, thank you so much, Jessica. And I, I hope uh, everyone found this really helpful. I certainly did. So all of you, we covered a lot. We know uh, Robin will be hard at work. Um, editing the video, compiling a fantastic newsletter for all of you who registered, which will have links to, to watch the video again, answers to your questions, links to all the products and articles that we mentioned. It does take us a few days, us, 
Robin, it's all Robin. It takes her a few days to get it together. So please be patient, but we will get it to you. And really, you know, the takeaway is that there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is help for you. It needs your you your approach to your digestive issues has to be tailored to you specifically. Uh, starting by understanding what your subtype is can go a long way uh, to getting you to the place where you want to be. And uh, Jessica has created these mini guides for us. So thank you so much, everybody. Just yes, thank you, thank you. Thank and you. Um, you know, if you're not, if for some reason you're not signed up for our newsletter, please do because that's where you will have alerts to other free webinars coming up. And thank you so much for being part of our community. And thank you, Jessica. This was thank great. Thank you. And one more thing, even though I don't have an alphabet guide for C, M's, and U's, I'm working on them. So download a mini guide because then they're tagged appropriately and you will know when there's an ultimate guide for your subtype out. But there is one for IBSD right now. So thank you again for having me. This is like a dream come true. I think I <laughs> read in my article that I wrote for VODMAP every day, but the first cookbook I bought when I had IBS was Day Day's cookbook. And um, even though you know it wasn't complete really because I didn't understand subtypes and things and roughage and the... It was just life changing to cook and nourish my body and feel better. So thank you. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone feels the same here. Day Day sure. and Robin, thank you for starting FODMAP every day as well, because it's a wealth of information and so happy to be part of the team. And yeah, um, I think you'll find the links where to find me if you have any other need to connect with me. Okay. Excellent. May everyone's bowel habits today be smooth sailing. That's our <laughs> sign off. <laughs> Thank sure. you, everybody. Bye-bye.